on earth is going on? What's your interpretation? Well, it's a very interesting move that Putin has put Gerasimov in charge now. Gerasimov is the chief of the general staff, so he is the number one soldier in Russia. And I think you can probably interpret this as being something of a sign of desperation. Um, Surakovin, who was put in place in October, had a fearsome reputation as being the person that reduced Aleppo and Syria to nothing. So it was really felt that he was the, the really hard man that could make a difference. Well, he clearly hasn't been able to make a difference. The other problem is you've got quite a lot of tension between mercenary groups and the proper Russian armed forces. The Wagner group has been trying to take Bakhmut for some time, terribly keen to achieve a success and to say to Putin, well, we can do it, even if your army can't do it. Mm. But actually, they're struggling and they haven't done it very well. So this attack on Solidar, which is a way of trying to get to Bakhmut, is another throw of the dice. But it's really interesting that Putin now, in some desperation, has put Gerasimov in overall charge. Mm. What's happening in Solidar? Well, it would appear that um, pretty World War I tactics are being employed. Um, a large number of... What do you mean by that? A large number of Russian soldiers, probably many of those recently conscripted in the army, and therefore pretty poorly trained, have been thrown forward in sort of human wave type attacks. Mm -hmm. And satellite imagery shows a vast number of dead bodies in the area where there's fighting going on. Um, the Wagner group tried to claim a couple of days ago that they'd taken Solidar. Both the Russian and the Ukrainian Ministry of Defence have said, well, actually, we're not quite so sure about it. So this actually underlines the tensions between the commanders of the Wagner Group, um, and that individual is trying very hard to get um, a, a high profile with Putin himself, uh, and the tensions in the leadership of the Russian army. Hence, Putin has put Gerasimov in overall charge. It's a bit of a last throw of the dice. It's a little bit like General Patrick Sanders, our Chief of the General Staff, suddenly being sent from London to wherever we've got a campaign going on because the government's getting desperate. So it, it's, it's very interesting to watch this development. What do we know about the Wagner Group? Well, we know it's a, ver a mercenary group that's been in existence for quite a number of years. It's been a kind of proxy for Russian foreign policy and Russian military around the world, um, pretty active in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. Um, it's a pretty nasty organisation. Uh, it's, it's led by someone with a very, very murky background um, who is, um, I'm sure you've shown the pictures in the past, of him going around prisons um, promising um, freedom if you come and fight to convicts. So it's populated with a lot of pretty nasty people who have got not much to lose in life. I mean, if you've been sentenced for some foul crime and you're in jail for probably the rest, the rest of your life, the opportunity to at least try and save a bit of your life by going to fight is quite a high motivation. So... It's, it's, frankly, it's, it's a sort of typically Russian move. You'd never see it happening in the West. And it's pretty disgraceful, actually. Uh, suggestions that they may be responsible for the disappearance of um, two men, two British men, Christopher Parry, 28, Andrew Bagshaw, who is 48, and suggestions that uh, a body has been found. Well, I, I mean, I can't comment on, on, on that detail. I think... As far as those two are concerned, one has to say, well, top marks for them for wanting to have the human motivation to go and help. But, of course, I think anybody thinking of doing that must realise that the risks are, are pretty high. So if you are motivated, um, and I would advise people not to go and become mercenaries, but people want to go out to that part of the world as aid workers to try and help, well, the motivation is admirable, but they've got to make sure that they're jolly careful to look after themselves and that they don't put themselves in undue uh, in undue danger. There's always some danger, but they should be really quite careful of measuring the risks to their own personal safety. Talk to me about Challenger tanks. We're suggesting <clears throat> that uh, 12 will go. That's mm. what Ben Wallace is um, suggesting. Is that enough? Well, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, I wrote a piece in one of the newspapers yesterday saying that um, the principle of sending some is right. 12 sounds pretty tokenistic to me. Given that we're only planning in this country to upgrade to Challenger 3 status, 136 of our tanks, and we have many more than that. It would seem that 12 is too tokenistic, and I would suggest sending 25 or 30 or even as many as 50. That would make a real difference. How, it, how, would, how does it make a difference on the battlefield? Well, <clears throat> where we are in the campaign is we're probably going to see the Russians mount some other form of offensive um, late winter, early spring. The Ukrainians, now supported even increasingly by the West, and particularly if we decide to gift them tanks and infantry fighting vehicles, should then be strong enough to mount a significant counter-offensive. And if they can do that well, there is a chance that they could strike decisive blows uh, on the Russians, perhaps even to break the morale of the Russian soldiers. 
And, of course, the, the, what's so important about that is that I can't see, most people can't see a negotiated settlement to this war. The opening positions are just irreconcilable. So if there's going to be a conclusion to this war in 2023, it's going to have to come on the battlefield. So the point really is that the West, America, France, Britain, Germany, really needs to get stuck in and behind and provide offensive capability to the Ukrainians so that they can mount an effective counteroffensive, break the will of the Russian army and actually win this war. That's what it's about now. We don't want to be here in a year's time, Kay, talking about the same things. Is it not, though, a serious upscale uh, by NATO countries in the situation in Ukraine? Where does that leave us? It's an upscale in terms of the capability, but it's not an upscale in principle. We have been providing all kinds of military hardware to the Ukrainians really since the start of this war and indeed before. This is different. It's not, it's not as if we're saying there should be a no-fly zone and NATO aircraft will be flying over, over Ukraine. That would be tantamount to the West actually physically getting involved with our own manpower. This is merely an upping of the scale of equipment that we're giving them and giving them an offensive capability. I, I don't see the issue of principle there. And, as I've just been saying, I think it's the right thing to do to give the Ukrainians a chance to win this war because unless they win this war, this war is going to drag on. How, finally, how secure is Putin, do you think, in his position? I think he's increasingly insecure. Um, I think he's insecure from a variety of threats. One is the ultra-nationalists and ultra-hardliners in the Kremlin who don't disagree with the war but disagree with the way that he's been running it. Um, and then I think there are others who actually are increasingly beginning to realise that this whole special military operation, a war now by any other name, is doing no good for Russia's reputation, no good for Russia's economy. And therefore, there are other groups that could be putting pressure on him. I've, I've said it before, and I'll, I'll say it again. I think the group of Russian leaders who are probably the most disaffected at the present moment are the Russian military leaders headed by Gerasimov. If he could find a plan and the moral courage to see it through, I could see a palace coup, a Kremlin coup, being led by Gerasimov, because the army is absolutely fed up with the interference that Putin has been exercising personally. They're desperately um, upset, if you like, <clears throat> by the way that corruption in their procurement system has produced them weapons that are manifestly inferior to Western weapons. So I think we need to watch Gerasimov quite, quite carefully. He could be the one for the um, Julius Caesar moment to stick in the knife. And do you think that Putin is very aware of that, which is why uh, we've seen the latest developments? I, I'm quite sure he's aware of it. He's probably trying to hold Gerasimov in quite close, but also putting the stakes on Gerasimov that um, if you fail, well, then you're out. Mm. Um, so I think what's going on in the Kremlin, and, of course, we don't know in detail, we're, we're only picking up scraps of information and <clears throat> trying to analyse them, but I think it's a very interesting time um, of what's going on in the Kremlin at the present moment. Keep your friends close and your enemies closer. That's it, Kay. <laughs> OK, my lord. Thank you very much indeed right. for joining us. Thank, Thank you. you.